Hello, good evening and welcome. Here we are again, Mark the Cabbie. It is The Late Show. It is Monday, the 25th of November, 2019. Time is absolutely flying. If you remember my last words last week, do you remember what I said? You might want to watch this week because I've got an interesting guest. Well, it never worked out, actually, but I've still got an interesting guest. <laughs> I've got my wife, Vicky. You haven't seen her for a while, and here she is. You're right, Vic. Yeah, hello. Evening, everybody. Yeah. Um, it's really good to be back with you. Brings back fond memories of uh, our shows we used to do a few years back. Yeah. So it's uh, going to be good. Oh, I'm so chuffed, Vic. Well, if you were wondering, I actually was trying to line up Matt the Plasterer to come back on, and um, it never worked out. He's almost, he's getting, he's definitely on the road to recovery, but he's not quite there ready to come before the cameras. So my beautiful wife stepped in. She said, come on then, let's do it, let's go for it. So here we are. So uh, real privilege to be here tonight. And tonight we're gonna address um, a little passage of scripture that's very rarely spoken upon. Um, in fact, looking back, I, I've only ever heard it preached on once, and that was um, by John MacArthur on Premier Christian Radio many, many years ago, absolutely donkey's years ago. And that is that famous line from the Lord Jesus when he spoke about the narrow path and the narrow gate. So if you've got your Bibles, well, I feel like I'm entering Hello Grandy. I feel like I'm doing the Bible study. <laughs> so, uh, I'll be Gordon. You can be Alan Tunn, all right? Right, Matthew 7. So if you've got your Bibles with you, it's Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, all right? It's an interactive show, so we would definitely love uh, loads of interaction with you. Uh, emails and texts, there you go. 07781 47 28 47. Email us live at revelationtv.com. Uh, get them coming in. Uh, try and keep them fairly short and succinct if you can. That'd be great. And and relevant to tonight's topic as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. narrow path. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, don't text us in and ask about uh, anything political because um, we can't speak about it because the election is on. So here we go. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few there be that find it. Okay? And funny enough, the very next line that he speaks is, beware of false prophets. So that probably ties in a little bit with what we've got to say. If you whiz over uh, to the next book, Oh, and that two books away to Luke 13, 24. And we've got a little bit of a, an addendum, a little bit of an add-on. Luke 13, 24. And the words of the Lord Jesus again. And Jesus said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Seemingly harmless, but if you look at the words in there, Jesus uses a couple of really, really strong words, and they are, they are this. On the second scripture in Luke, um, he says the word strive. It's the Greek word agonizomai, and it's the root word from which we, in English, get the word um, agonize. So what actually Jesus is saying to us is agonize to enter through the narrow gate. Um, Vicky, much of what is presented as the gospel in these later years, especially in the West, is, I do believe, a very watered down and a bit of a false gospel going on. And it's often presented, isn't it, as follow Jesus, isn't it? Just give him your heart, invite him into your heart, invite him in, and, um, and everything's going to be great, and you're going to go from strength to strength and, and have what you really want, a great life, you know? And yet, Jesus says the plain opposite, doesn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Um, are you going to read that in Scripture? What oh, well, he says, yeah. Yeah, well, listen to what he says. Um, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. And on the other one, it says, Matthew, Mark, Luke. So if we go to back to Matthew 7, and the other interesting word is, uh, because difficult, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Um, because narrow is the gate, and here's the word, difficult is the way which leads to life, okay? Difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few that find it. Um, that word difficult is uh, an extension of the Greek word thalibo, and means compressed, i.e. like grapes, compressed, pressured, narrowed, straightened, uh, put upon, and can also be 
um, used metaphorically to, to mean trouble, afflicted, and distressed. Now, it just really hit me, Vic, that when we give out the call to salvation these days, um, can you imagine if we did it biblically? Who's up for a distressed life sometimes? Not always. Who's up for a troubled life? Who's up to be constricted, hemmed in, narrowed in? Who's up to be pressured? Who's up to be sidelined, you know? But do you not think those that actually have managed to find the narrow path could say yes to most of that? Their lives have been pressed deeply. It's been tough, it's been hard and um, agonising. Yeah. I think a lot of truly born-again Christians will put their hands up and say, that's me. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we often have the chat, don't we? As we look back over our Christian lives, we often look at the carnage of the people that have been left behind, you know, the people that many years ago, we, we became Christians, what, 23 years ago? And as we look back now, we look at the people that, you know, prayed the sinner's prayer, gave their lives to the Lord, and they've just fallen by the wayside, haven't they? One by one, couple by couple. Um, and you look back and you think, that's where that, that nugget of a question comes in. Were these people really saved? Were perhaps they? Perhaps that narrow path was just a little bit too hard? Well, it would seem so, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because, mm. you know, we're... We speak... the, the Broadway seems so much more appealing, doesn't it? Well, it's easy, isn't it? Mm. I and mean, we know what our flesh is like and our minds are like. You know, if, we, if we're given the offer of, uh, you know, two weeks in Barbados, all costs paid for, you know, or three days in Skegness, no offence, Skegness, or three days in Skegness and you pay your bills, we know where we'd want to go, and that's all fine. And spiritually, that has deeper connotations, you know, because the, the, the broken human spirit, the sin in our flesh, is just so desperate for an easy life, isn't it, Vicky, you know? Yeah. And sometimes I... Well, not sometimes, I often wonder why we give out such a beautiful-sounding gospel, uh, a beautiful-sounding journey, you know? Jesus said to agonise, to coming through the narrow gate. By the very extension of that, the narrow gate is a gate where you come in one by one. Um, you come in, you haven't got room to bring your baggage, all your presuppositions of a Christian and a spiritual life, you just leave them at the door, uh, all your preconceived ideas, um, and you come in one by one and you bow to the Lordship of Christ. And I think that's one of the things, Vicky, where many people find it tough because suddenly you've, you find this, this God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who uh, claims to be who he said and says, I proved it by my resurrection. You can make me Lord now. Many people can't give up their lordship over their lives, can they, Vicky? It's, um, it's, it's like, no, I'll, I'll, I'll have a little bit of Jesus, but really I'll stay the Lord. What do you think on that, Vic? People like home comforts, we all do. We'd, we'd rather choose that. Yeah. But if you've chosen Christ to be in your life, you don't actually get a choice. The Lord actually knows what is best for us. Yeah. We don't know what's best for us. Yeah. Um, so what we would choose and what our flesh would choose, uh, the Lord has other ideas because he knows best. And it's only through affliction and hardship that your faith could be tested and uh, the fruits of the Spirit can grow you know, the patience, long-suffering, all these things the Bible talks about. And it, it's you have to go through these things. Now, the Lord doesn't always leave us there. Um, we look back on our life and there's been the most amazing times. Um, and, and they keep you going those times. Yeah. Um, but I think what we're saying is don't actually expect, um, when you accept Jesus into your life, for it to be easy. Um, it's the most wonderful decision you can ever make, but the Bible is very clear. Um, you have to agonise to get on it and stay on it. Yeah. And agonise is a strong word. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Jesus followed up, as we said in those the scriptures there, he's, <laughs> the very next words he says were, well, beware of false prophets. And we know that in the end days, there's going to be a never-ending, you know, whole list, litany of people that are, are lining up um, uh, to tell you a, a few porky pies and give you a, a, this, you know, this beautifully dressed up gospel, um, which basically says, come in, grab your health, wealth and happiness, keep running and keep running till you get to the end. And that really isn't the case. We're not saying that um, blessings aren't of God because blessings, of course, are of God and he gives you little oases as you go along. But we, you really need to beware. You know, you need to be like 
the stories that Jesus spoke about, about the, the builder that decided to build a tower and, you know, and counted the cost of building before he started building. No point underestimating the cost of labour and the cost of materials and getting halfway up this nice high building and then suddenly having to leave it, you know? Um, some of the stories that... Let's go back to Luke, Vicky. Let's go back to Luke 9. And let's listen to the three uh, little stories that the Lord gave straight after basically saying how hard it's going to be. Uh, we go to Luke 9, 57. Okay. Subtitled in my Bible, The Cost of Discipleship. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Okay. So he's eager, he's keen, and his flesh is desperate to follow the Lord. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, you can imagine in church today, the hand goes up at the altar call, I'll follow, great, come over here, brilliant stuff, sign you up, give you a little, little pamphlet, away you go, see you next week at church, great. No, Jesus didn't do any of that. He didn't say, oh, great, buddy, come and follow me, we'll have the time of our life. He said to them, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He's speaking about the uncertainty of the Christian life, okay? The uncertainty of day-to-day -day rudimentary stuff. This is the man that created the universe. This is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had nowhere to lay his head, nowhere permanent, no permanent abode, okay? The next story, he says, then he said to another, follow me. But he said, the, the, the guy said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, I mean, we're, you know, we're all so touchy-feely these days, aren't we? And we're so desperate to be offended and, and we love to be offended because it means we can complain and make ourselves feel better. Can you imagine Jesus around now? Can you imagine Jesus on, on some of the, uh, in some of the, the great churches that we look to and think is great? <laughs> Instead of just saying, yeah, come on, come and follow me, uh, Jesus said to this guy, you know, after he said, let me go and bury my father, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now, in Jewish custom, uh, when people died, Vicky, they were buried very, very quickly. So it's highly unlikely that this man was walking around with Jesus, listening to his stories, and had a dead dad at home waiting to be buried. So it's very, very unlikely. What he's basically saying is, Lord, can I, can I go home and just be with my dying father until his last breath? Now, this isn't to say that Jesus is against going home and being with dying people, far from it. But what he's doing, he's laying out for you the cost of discipleship in stark terms. He's saying, let the dead bury their own dead. Dead people don't bury dead people because they're already dead. What Jesus is talking about is let the spiritually dead people bury their own dead. These people have rejected the Lord's message, so they're spiritually dead, they're still in their sins. And he's saying to this man, let the dead bury their own dead. You're going to say something there, Vic? No, we were chatting about it earlier, wasn't we? And um, it's more important, actually, you drop everything and just follow Jesus Christ. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. Um, people are starting to send in emails and texts, so thank you for that. Shall I get a couple in now? Yeah, go for it, Vic. OK, uh, no name on this one. Some Christians say people who do not accept and follow Jesus as he is in the Bible are condemned to hell. Uh, she's named Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, etc. That is seen as harsh, but if you can be saved without believing in Jesus, it negates the whole reason he came and died. Should Christians warn of hell, narrow is the gate to other religions, etc. Mm. No, absolutely spot on, and we should warn of hell, absolutely, because unless you are born again, John Free Free, um, that's where you're heading. That's, it's as simple as that, because you need a regenerated spirit. I don't think people actually realise it's real. No, they don't. It's, 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 yeah, um, not everybody believes. No, they absolutely don't. Jesus said, unless, you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were full of, you know, they were very zealous for the law. They were picking the law to pieces, adding their own traditions. Uh, and Jesus said, basically, unless your righteousness exceeds them, Jesus is actually saying entrance into heaven is to be perfect. Yeah. And so he looks at us in the, in the eyes, Vicky, and he says... If you want to come to heaven, you need to be perfect. Now, to the person that realises that's a pointless and not pointless, that's a hopeless cause because you haven't got, you've got no hope whatsoever, 
And Jesus says, actually, I, I'm perfect and you can have my righteousness, righteousness. I will impute it to you. But the person that is full of self-righteousness and pride and says, no, I'm, I'm good. I, I'm good because um, I'll, I'm good. I'm a good person. I've never committed adultery. Well, good on you. That's great. But Jesus actually takes the actual moral level of the law even higher. And he says, have you ever lusted after the summer, someone that's not your husband or your wife? And that condemns everyone. Absolutely everyone. It's all covered, isn't it? There's no covered. escape. There yeah. is no escape. Yeah. So if you're out there tonight um, and you're busy trying to be good to get into heaven, do yourself the world's biggest favour and surrender. Jesus is calling you and saying, don't bother trying to be good. There is none righteous, no, not one, the Lord says. Let him give you his righteousness. Give up the fight and let him come into your life. That's what he's saying. Go on, Vic. You got another one? Hi, Mark and Vicky. I have heard many sermons on the narrow path. There are two, if I'm correct. There is the wide path that is easy, but leads to things not so good, and a narrow path that is hard to navigate. But boy, what joy will await at the end. Yeah. The narrow path has problems and life can be hard, but on that path, God walks with you. But the wide path is the path of the world. God is not on that path and it ends badly. So we should use the narrow path, however hard it may be. That is uh, me, hard life. But with the Lord by my side, wow. I will get to the end of the narrow way and get my reward. Wow. That's from Andrew. Thanks, Thank Andrew. You, Andrew. What a lovely text. Amanda from Belfast. Yeah. I have a friend who believes some strange doctrine and doesn't listen to reason. I feel I need to stop being around him. What do you think? Wow. I mean, obviously, I'm answering after one line of questioning, so I've no idea what your, your relationship with this person is. Um, I, I think you can go with your spirit, your conscience. Yeah, if your I mean, conscience is telling you it, it's, you know, time to end that friendship, you kind of need to listen to that. Um, but, yeah, if you've given them the gospel um, and you've tried and tried and, they, and they're literally wacky, um, maybe the Lord is calling, you know, um, time to part. Yeah. What, what fellowship has darkness with light, you know? Exactly, yeah. You know, this world with, with the darkness world, it's, um, there is no fellowship. I mean, I've, I've got some lovely, unbelieving friends um, that know the gospel, uh, rejected it, and that's fine. They're still my friends, great friends. I, you know, good laughs, but um, you... you they're not trying to take you away, are no, they? No, they're not different trying to doctrine. take you away. No, into, into various the doctrines of demons and, and various things, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just, just be very wary. If, someone's, if, if someone spiritually is draining you, um, just, just be wary of, you know, how much time you spend with them, really, you know. Right, Patricia. Yeah. Good evening, Mark and Vicky. I can't believe you are discussing this tonight. I watched a pastor teaching this on YouTube on Saturday yeah. and on Sunday at church, the minister talked about this and now you. Oh. Obviously, the Lord is trying to tell me something. I pray every day for the Lord to keep my family on the narrow path as they have not yet given their life to Christ. God bless you both. But we don't give up, do we? Who's that from, Vic? Patricia. Oh, bless you, Patricia. What a lovely, lovely email. And Alan says, heavy subject, God bless you, God bless us. Alan in Farnborough. Oh, Farnborough Hamps or Farnborough Kent. We know you to know that, Alan. <laughs> you, could be, you could be near us with one of those. <laughs> I'll give you another quick story, yeah, sure. uh, Vicky. Um, Jesus also said in Luke 9, 61, another person said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, sounds like a good idea, let's shoot back, have a cup of Horlicks, a packet of Ringo's, say goodbye, and off we go on our merry way. Jesus said to him, no, no one, having put his hand to the plough and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. <laughs> I mean, the, all this Jesus, Jesus, meek and mild uh, stuff is a very true, up to a point. But he was also one of the hardest-hitting speakers this world's ever seen and certainly didn't uh, try and hide the message behind a, a veiled curtain of velvet Jesus is basically saying, he's not against going back to saying, you know, hello to your family, this, that and the other. Don't, don't infer that from these scriptures, but do infer that the Lord is saying, the kingdom of God, once you get, you know, once you put onto it and decide to go with it, that's it. There's no looking back. In the old days when they ploughed a field, it was very hard to plough a straight furrow 
So what the person would do, they would look right at the end of the field for a, a, some sort of point where they could look, a rock or a bush, and they would keep their eyes fixed on that as they ploughed a straight furrow towards the, the point into the distance. And our point as Christians um, is, can you imagine this, to rule and reign with Christ in the kingdom to come. Vic, how does that sound? I mean, that, that, those words rolled off my tongue, <laughs> your face, those words rolled off my tongue. Can you imagine, Vicky, ruling and reigning with the Lord in the kingdom to come? That, it's almost mind-bogglingly ridiculous, isn't it, to even think it? We've got it all to come, haven't we? All to look forward to. Yeah. Um, yeah, th th this narrow path is so going to be worth it. Yeah. Um, but we're not alone. God does walk with us and he's prepared the way. He's, he's, everything we need to know is in that book, the Bible. Um, so we're without excuse, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, got quite a few more coming in. A few seconds. Mm -hmm. I'll just say why many people can't and don't give their life. Well, I say many, actually. I'd say the vast majority, because, be honest, the churches are empty and most people you meet, the word Jesus is a blasphemous word and it's, that's just a word they use to swear. That's off the charts now, actually. It is, it's everywhere. We've now. noticed. It, it really is everywhere. The Lord's so, name is used in vain every second. Yeah. Yeah, I can't stand it. One of the reasons that many people uh, don't come to the Lord is because now we're so oppressed with this pluralistic society. Many ways lead to God, don't they? Pick whatever prophet you want, pick whatever religious leader you want, and hey presto, at the end of the day, all roads lead to God. And no, they don't. And Jesus was emphatic about that. No, they don't. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Apart from me, you cannot please God. Apart from faith, you cannot please God. There is no other way that we can get to the Father apart from him, none. And all the other prophets that we think about, um, I put prophets in inverted commas, heavy inverted commas, all these other religious leaders, they've all got one thing in common. They're all dust and bones and ash now, and you can go and visit most of their tombs and stand there and put flowers on them. Our Lord is different. And he said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. He wasn't talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem, he was talking about his body. And uh, only those with eyes and ears to understand could see what he was talking about. And that's exactly what he did. He came back from the dead. If ever you want to know the calling card and the qualifications for someone um, declaring to be omnipotent, ask them to beat death. Because no one does. There's only one man that's done it. There's only one man. You got any more text there, Vic? Yeah. Um, do you think this verse is for those before Jesus died who were under the law? Um, or is it still so hard now that we have the grace of God through Jesus' sacrifice? And that's from Jane Bond. Beautiful text there, Jane. I believe it's a bit of both because he's talking about true salvation, OK? So coming under the true auspices of a true salvation, a true gospel, a real gospel, count the cost. Once you're on the pathway, Jane, beautiful. Yep, we have the grace of God to sustain us, well, not day by day, but minute by minute. Mm. When you... When you finally get onto that narrow path, you realise what an absolutely impossible job this is, don't you? You really do, if you're on the narrow path. And lovely question, Jane. Once we're on it, we are covered, filled, led by grace, grace-filled, Holy Spirit-filled. We have grace for those, those bad moments when we fall. We have grace for those terrible moments when we, when we let ourselves down and the Lord down. Um, he's not saying that you won't stop sinning at all, but what he is saying, um, one of the marks of the Christian is that you won't continue living uh, as if you were still in this world, OK? So uh, if you were living with your boyfriend when you came to Christ, if 10 years later you're still living with your boyfriend, um, seriously question yourself, absolutely seriously question yourself. Hebrews 13, 4 says that the marriage bed is undefiled. And by implication, you can take the implication from that, the marriage bed is undefiled, work out your own implications for that. And he says, uh, fornicators and adulterers, I will judge. So we often give, you know, um, give, their word, give our words to the Lord and apparently give our hearts to the Lord, but often the fruits of our lives don't bear any transitional nature whatsoever. I remember Matt and I, we used to have great problems on word and prayer. We'd be really, it would really perplex us actually, Vicky. Mm. We'd get beautiful people texting in. Mm. 
oh, hi, uh, hi, Mark and Matt. Um, um, blah, 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 my boyfriend this, my girlfriend that, been living together six years, got two kids. And we had great difficulty in, in praying any sort of blessing or any, any sort of positive prayer because if you're still in that stage and you're confessing Christ, you're under judgment. You're actually under judgment because when you confess him as Lord, you, you follow his moral absolutes and you follow his law, the law that's written on our hearts. And the world lives with boyfriends and girlfriends. Christians shouldn't be doing that. This is one of those things where we're supposed to be separate. We're called out. The church is ecclesia, the called out ones, you know. So yes, Jane, we're absolutely called to live in grace and fine, we've got grace for the, grace for the journey. But um, we, when we came, come to the Lord as, as our Lord, we follow his moral absolutes and his standards. And sometimes we don't want to compromise, you know, we're, we, we, we don't want to compromise our worldly position because it's nice and comfortable, isn't it, you know? But grace is there for when you fall, not as, uh, not as a complete license to sin and not, as, not to stay in sin, you know? Good question, Jane. Yeah. Um, this one is um, from Gary, or otherwise known as Gaz the Cabbie, ex-cabbie now. He's very glad he's found you, but he's lost your number. Can you send it to him, please? Oh, Gary, do you know what? Brilliant. Gaz the ex-cabbie. Well, you're talking to Mark the ex-cabbie, because I've had enough as well. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't take any more than 25 years of fun and games. But that's a long story. That's a long story. <laughs> For another time. Gaz, I'll send you my number. <laughs> I am, do you know what? I'm so chuffed. That is absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. OK, Mike here. When I first became a Christian in 1974, there was a song called The Candy Coated Gospel, right. which went, Take the, takes the crown of blessings and leaves the crown of thorns. Wow. I don't know that one, but... No, I must admit. Yeah. yeah. And what's his name, Mike? Yes. Takes the crown of blessings yeah. and leaves the crown of thorns. Wow. OK, heavy stuff. OK. Heavy stuff, um, thanks, Mike. This one is the lovely Norma D. I believe you're a Oh, Scotland. we know Norma. We know Norma. And she says, the way is very narrow, so narrow, we can only take the journey alone. And you were speaking about that earlier. Through the gate. We don't go on that narrow path and through the gate. You know, multitudes, it's literally one at a time. You were on your own. Um, yes, we can tell others, but we cannot take them with us. Spot. It is a very lonely life in terms of people around us. But I have to say, it is rich and full of our Lord's comfort. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, the journey is full of danger and sadness, yet never destroying our inner joy. And she put, um, hope you understand what I'm trying to say so badly. Not at all. Totally get that, Norma, and uh, agree with you. Wow, that is heavy. Um, now, this text. one, um, on, Dave says, it's not always possible to stay on the narrow path, even though you want to. For example, if I went to see someone going for one of my kids um, with a knife, I would take him out first. So would I, Dave. Um, he put, hence, I would have strayed off the narrow path. I would have been forced off through no fault of my own. No one in their right mind would let one of their kids be murdered. Yeah, so no, how that's, would you that, respond that's, to that? That's not straying off the narrow path. That's just being totally defence. That's to self defence. That's not. Yeah, what we're talking about Dave. I mean, I'd, I'd be there as well. I'd, I'd absolutely. It's, it's, we're, we're not Christians it, and weak, are no, we? No, no, no. Listen, Dave. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. And I tell you now, if someone broke into my house and you know we was all under threat, one Corinthians sixteen says, "Quit ye like men." Act like men. That doesn't mean get my sandals and my socks on and stand there and surrender. That means get out there and defend your family. Absolutely right. Leaving the narrow path is a pattern of life, not one-off little things where we err here and there. Leaving, leaving the narrow path, Dave, would, you be, would be you going around beating people up every half an hour for the next 20 years. That's when you've left the narrow path, not when you've defended your kids. Absolutely fine. Absol act, act like men. Act like men. That's absolutely right. You're not called to stand there and watch your family be butchered. In fact, that would be the most bizarre thing on earth. I think people do get the wrong impression yeah, of Christians. Um, the Lord, you know, he talks about us being bold and courageous, not weak. Um, we might have times of feeling quite weak, but we can stand up for ourselves, you know? Yeah. Um, he tells us to have our full body armour on, you know? Um, there's battles going on and we, we need to fight them sometimes. Absolutely, Vic, yeah. No, yeah. Dave, that's, don't worry about that, mate. That's, uh, you're not coming off the narrow path. That's being a normal dad. OK, uh, Frankie in Belfast says, hey. um, the word strive. Every morning I open my eyes, thank the Lord that I'm alive, wow. and then I strive. I have my flesh attack, also Satan, and I pray for inner strength to face this decaying world. 
But as 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 9 says, I'm not destroyed, far, far from it. Uh, for though Jesus, through Jesus Christ, I am sustained every day. Praise the Lord our God. Stay blessed, champs. Frankie. Wow, that is, thank you, Frankie. Absolutely, Frank. Mm. Fabulous text. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we're not, when we say strive, okay, we're, once we're on the path, um, there is a continual, because this world is fallen and our, world, uh, and our lives are broken and fallen, this world is decaying, all right? So are your bodies, um, and, and it's just going to get harder from here. I mean, my hair is not going to grow back anytime soon, and I probably, unless I go down and get my eyes done, uh, I'll be wearing glasses till my dying day. That's because we're all decaying, okay? The whole lot is decaying. So when we strive, it's not we're striving to please uh, God for our salvation because our salvation is already secured and we can rest in that. That's why Jesus is sat down at the right hand of God in heaven and we are sat down with him. Uh, read Watchman Nee's awesome book, or is it Witness League? One of the two. I think it's called Sit, Walk and Stand, all right? Sit, Walk and Stand. Still probably the most profound book I've ever read. So we strive in this world because we're overcoming sin, we're overcoming our flesh, the world, the devil, and if you're on this narrow path, you're going to be highly aware of your sinful nature and the evil which surrounds us. So that's the striving. Our striving is not to be made right with God because we enter into that relationship by faith, uh, accepting his full atoning death on the cross as our gift of eternal life. We've been redeemed, brought back from the uh, slave market. But our striving is against the world, against our flesh and against the enemy. OK, against the enemy. Good stuff. Thank you, Frankie. Any others there, Vic? Um, Jeff made me chuckle, oh, so thank sure. you, Jeff, for your email. <laughs> I shall share that with Mark later. Um, and there is one here, someone saying, um, because so few find that narrow path, does it mean Satan has won? It's a good question, isn't it? Very good. That's a great question. Yeah. Put a name on that. <laughs> I need a name. No name? No. Brilliant question. Satan's won. I mean, that sort of puts a bit, bit of a temporary victory post on the situation because in the end we know that we've read the end of the book and we know that the Lord wins and we know that whomever the Lord calls they will come let's go to John 10 let's go to John 10 anyone that's new to the Bible Matthew Mark Luke and John do we have a bit of John 10 yeah no Satan doesn't win in the end he knows his time is short and um and then I'm going to go to a little little used Old Testament verse um, John 10, going towards the end, Satan doesn't win. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you're not of my sheep, okay? You're not called. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my, my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Are one. We're back to Isaiah 55 verse 11. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? This is the work of the Word. When the Lord sends the Word out to, um, to the people, the Holy Spirit never comes back void. So shall, so shall my Word be that goes forth from my mouth it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. When the word reaches the chosen ones, the elect, it takes seed, it germinates and it grows. And no matter what ground you're walking upon, these people will flourish, will prosper um, and will press on until eternal life. They, they will, okay? I, uh, my son's going to laugh at this. We always, we, this is mine and my son's favourite uh, favourite subject in the whole of Holy Scripture, election. <laughs> and we're not going to go there tonight, but I know that my son is now laughing. I truly believe in the uh, the sovereign sovereignty of God and his election, OK? When we see false salvations, what we're seeing, we're seeing responses of the flesh to the gospel call. When God has elected you from before the foundation of the earth, those elect people will have that word quickened in their spirit. Um, their eyes and their ears will be opened by faith. Uh, it's a divine faith and you will not, you, you will come you, and you will not be lost, okay? 
you will simply not be lost. If you are truly saved, you will truly, truly hear, you will truly receive, you will receive by faith, you will walk on in faith, you will persevere until the end. And the Lord says, I will lose none of them. Now, does that mean we all know who's elect and who's not? I haven't got, I haven't got the foggiest. I haven't got the foggiest who's elect and who's not, but it's my joy to give the gospel so that the effectual call of salvation goes out to as many people as I can get it to and that the Lord can do his work by his word and by his spirit, you know? Absolutely good stuff, good stuff. Any, any... We've got lots, actually. Great. Um, so thank you. Uh, Linda, um, she says, I don't know how I could get through some of the situations that I have been through if the Lord had not saved me. I will never be alone. Isn't that amazing? Wow, beautiful. Um, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13. Yeah. Uh, Peggy says, I'd like to dis distinguish between salvation and discipleship, getting saved and following Thank you. Beautiful. Absolutely, yeah. Jesus said, go and make disciples, not converts. And absolutely right. If you are truly saved, you will become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and not just a number on a tick box where the evangelist shoots home and said, yeah, I've got 6,000 uh, 6, hands up today, um, wherever they went. Yeah, no, there's a huge difference, huge difference. Ricky is asking, how do we understand my yoke is easy and my burden is light compared to a hard and difficult road? Is Jesus contradicting himself? Beautiful question, Ricky. What I do believe the Lord is saying there when he talks about my yoke is easy and my burden is light is to do with the law, okay? Um, he came and fulfilled the law perfectly. And what he's saying is, come and join with me. Forget all the Pharisees who are laying on, you know, they're going past the 613 laws laid down in, in Scripture and they're putting their own traditions of men. They were making it virtually impossible for people to come in. But Jesus is saying, if you come with me, okay, you will take my righteousness. I will impute that to your account. I will make you righteously perfect, okay? And you won't have to fulfill the law. The law, you'll be dead to the law because you, you are died and you're buried with baptism, baptism in Christ. You're raised to newness of life. And you won't have to sit there thinking, oh, have I just broken law number 468? No, what Jesus is saying is, no, I'm your righteousness, I'm your perfection, follow me, and then I will give you the Holy Spirit, I'll write this Holy Spirit on your minds and on your hearts, and just follow me, and just follow the Holy Spirit. And you haven't got to sit there delineating, thinking, is this sin, is this, am I breaking law number 83? You know, it's not, a, it's not a game of bingo. Just follow the Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit lead you. And then that way, Jesus, his yoke and his burden, if you're walking in concert with him, remember the, the yoke was what was put on oxen and they were put around the oxen and the bulls, uh, shoulders and necks, and they pulled together, okay? So if you're pulling with the Lord uh, together with him in this life, it doesn't mean that you'll have an easy life. What it means is that you're, your spiritual life is sealed, signed and secure because you're following with the Lord. He's bought for, you, bought for you, paid for you by his blood and where the law is concerned, you're walking with him and you are perfect because he is perfect. It's not anything to do with a hard life. Many of the greatest Christian people that we know, read and love about today had some of the most horrendous situations going on. Horatio Spafford, it is well with my soul. If there's one song in church that will get me to well up and a, a tear come to my eye, it is Horatio Spafford. It is well with my soul. Man sold out for Christ and uh, the story goes that on their way back from America, he put his wife and I think three or four kids on, on one boat, the boat before him to go back to Britain, I think it was. The boat sunk, he lost his wife and children um, and yet that man still managed to write a few years later, it is well with my soul. To the world, there's no health, wealth and prosperity in Horatio Spafford's life. The Lord must look at him and think, wow, what beautiful faith, what beautiful perseverance, what an overcoming spirit. It's overcoming that we get to enter the kingdom of God, you know. Through many tribulations, we must persevere and endure. So it's nothing to do with an easy life. In fact, if you sign up, as you've heard from the words of Jesus tonight, expect a really tough one. Do you know what? I had a small accident today in my car with one of my pupils. Um, doesn't surprise me whatsoever because I was coming on tonight, really looking forward to tonight's show with Vicky. And uh, the enemy was desperate to get me put off and uh, in a bad frame of mind for tonight. And yet all turned out to be really well, as you know, didn't it, Vic? You know? All is well with your soul. All is well. And that's... Only in Christ could you go and write a song like that. Oh, yeah. no chance in the flesh. Can you imagine it? No. No chance. Yeah. Great um, question. We've though. got lots coming in. So um, Hayden, he's asking um, a good question. 
Um, he says he's being honest. Um, why would God create so many billions of beautiful people only to lose probably 99% of them to the broad gate? Um, he says it doesn't seem to make sense. Aidan, great question. I haven't got a clue. I literally haven't got a clue. The foundations of this world and the beginnings of this earth and universe are so far beyond man's finite minds, including my own, and um, I really don't know. I, I, I really haven't got a clue. I'm really sorry, Hayden. Yeah, that's my honest answer. Yeah. Yeah, next question. Alistair, thank you. Can Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses be saved? They believe in Jesus and the Bible, yet very different beliefs about Jesus to mainstream Christianity. Yeah. Uh, the answer is no, because they believe in a false Jesus and a false Bible. And, um, yeah, no. So, basically, I'm, I used to have a lovely chat with the guy. I used to go and get my diesel for my cab, and I'd have a chat with him every single day. And he'd left, he'd left the J, uh, JWs years before and presented himself as a brother of mine, you know? And we had some good chats over the years, uh, over the months, and um, it niggled me for months. It niggled me that... He'd left the JWs, but he hadn't really left the JWs. And I won't give his name out. And I was prompted by the Lord when I went in there once to pay for my diesel, and I, I, I won't give his name, but I said, um, so and so, you, you, do you believe that Jesus is God? Oh, no, 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 absolutely not, absolutely not. And, uh, and this is going to sound harsh, but nothing like as hard, harsh as Jesus. And I said, you're no brother of mine. And uh, I said, I wish you well name and uh, never saw him again because he'd had chats with me we'd sp spoken about scripture every day six days a week for about a year and that man hadn't left the JWs he'd left in his mind he'd been disfellowshipped but no Jesus was still not God still full of all their doctrines still full of doctrine mm. so no they can't be saved not with their false Jesus and their false scripture yeah Okay, Sue says, in hindsight, we can look back to see that when we called on Jesus in prayer to help us, he answered. He is faithful to his word and we can trust him explicitly. Wow, how beautiful is that? Um, beautiful. <clears throat> most churches I know preach that there is, ver there is a very, very wide path. Jeremiah said, they dress the wound of my people as if it were not serious. Um, they've not got the full scripture here, um, but anyway... Uh, that's from Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. A okay. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Nina, good evening to you. I needed to hear this message this evening. Feel like I'm squeezing through my path. I'm stuck in a quagmire of anxiety and depression, poor health and an awful housing situation. Any scripture you can give me through this, I'm praying. Um, so she's praying, but she's not hearing any answers. What is Thank her name? you so much. And that is from Nina. Nina. Nina, bless you, my sister. Where is it? Okay. Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2 for you, Nina. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, Nina, for I have redeemed you. Okay. I've called you by your name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters which you are doing now, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Okay? <sighs> Trials, temptations, pain. As we heard earlier, the word um, difficult. Jesus said the word difficult. It has connotations of pressure, being pressed, pressed down into, in a straight gate, in a straight and way, a, a narrow, tough, uh, outside pressures, and, it, and you can use it in so much as talking about distresses, anxieties. Some of the most godly people I know are full of anxiety. And then the legalists will say, yeah, but Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. Yeah, we know that. And I've never met a single person in this world that's ever kept that perfectly either, OK? So <laughs> some of the biggest names led really, really tough lives. Look at Pastor Richard Wormbrand, you know, all those years in a communist jail. I mean, this is, some of this stuff is off the charts, isn't it? So you are not alone. You are absolutely not alone. And even though your flesh will be saying no, rejoice. Praise the Lord in it, Nina, OK? Some of the times when I literally couldn't go on with Vicky, we, we've just had to look up, look to what is future, what is our eternal destiny, 
ruling and reigning with the Lord. And we have, that's why it's called the sacrifice of praise. The Lord is looking for your reaction. We can't, we can't govern what happens in our lives, Nina, but we can govern as Christians our reactions to them. And I, I, I pray the Lord be with you and you feel, be filled with the Spirit and come through this situation. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jane Gordon. Oh, Jane, our little mate. Jane, yeah. you've got to put some weight on like me. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, I know you've lost some weight and I've lost some serious weight. <laughs> well, Jane says, yes, the path could be very painful, but the wide path leads to spiritual death. How? And that is very true. Is that? Yeah. Absolutely. That's why Jesus said, beware the false prophets, the ravenous wolves. Oh, yeah. I don't need to say anymore. You just, you, you should just have your eyes opened, okay? Your eyes and ears of faith, they stand out like a mile. Okay, we've got Samuel from Northern Ireland. Remember the days gone by when all shops were closed on Sundays? Why did we ever lose that? One rest day a week eases all our pain. I'm so with you on that. I have to say that all the time. Sundays are crazy now, aren't they? Yeah. Um, we talk about the good old days. I remember when our parents used to talk about the good old days, but even we do. Um, every day is exactly the same now. There's, there's no day of rest. doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, it's horrible, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's quite sad, really, because the Lord knew what he was doing. Um, his instruction is good for us. It's, it's good for our flesh. And he knew our bodies and our minds needed a day of rest. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been in that great book. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we're all falling now in so many ways. Um, we're, we're not looking after ourselves, are we? No. Um, Rest is absolutely crucial. So, yeah, absolutely with you, Samuel, on that one. Yeah, Samuel, this country has decided to sell its Judeo-Christian roots down the river and we're reaping a harvest of nightmares now. Society's imploding and, uh, well, you only got to watch the news for 10 minutes. I know, I know the news is only bad news and that's all it's ever been, but now this country is in a complete, total and utter, utter mess. Remember End Time Pete? Um, a few of you loved End Time Pete. I did a couple of lovely shows with him. Well, um, Pete answered the call of the Lord. Uh, this because he knew he. Pete um, stands outside, preaching outside, you know, on the streets, and he tells it as he is. You, th you thought I was hardcore. You have seen nothing until you've met in time, Pete. And the Lord basically showed Pete what was coming with this country. And uh, anyway, he's emigrated to Texas in America. A job came up, and he's disappeared. There's religious freedom over there. There's freedom for Christians out there and uh, his, his anxiety levels have come back down. So thanks for deserting us, Pete. I'll see you soon. <laughs> um, we've got a viewer here, no name, just recommending some uh, YouTube clips. Yep. There's one, Evolutionist to Creationist, and that's by Professor Walter uh, Veith. Walter Veith. I don't know that one. I no, and um, from Muslim to Adventist, so people can look those up if they wish. Well, okay. Um, Grace is the mother and nurse of holiness, not the apologist for sin. Blessings in Yeshua. And that is from Karen. Wow, that was Carrick heavy, Fergus. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Romans somewhere says, shall we then continue to sin? And uh, the Bible says, no, by all means not. How can you, if you've died to sin, still carry on living in it? Romans 6-ish, I think, 6-7, around about there. Thank you, thank you. Um, Keith here is saying we're making it sound like the narrow path is rules or performance based. Oh, from it. Salvation is a free gift simply because we can't earn it by trying to stop sinning. Um, salvation doesn't involve obedience to rules. It's not what we were no, saying. No. Um, not at all. Did you want to have a word on that? Just I haven't, really, I haven't really said any of that. Misunderstood. What I'm saying is count the cost, dear brother, before you come in because salvation is not easy. Uh, salvation was bought with a great cost. And what we're saying is, you know, if you're fed this health, wealth and happiness malarkey before you come in, you're going to be on the wrong, on the wrong doorway before you even come in. It's got nothing to do with being rules-based uh, at all whatsoever. In fact, it's the complete opposite. This is a quote from Charles Spurgeon, uh, no name. <clears throat> thou art a member of Christ's body, and as such thou cannot die. Thou art a sheep of his pasture, and as such he will never lose thee. Well, I like a bit of... Charles Spurgeon. We've got down to our last five minutes, Vic, so... OK, did you want to have a no, word? Keep, keep um, reading, yeah, let's get through as many uh, as, as we can. 
Okay, so we've got Nick here. He came to the Lord nearly 40 years ago. After about 10 years of following him, he went his own way for a few years. During the ta that time, he married an unbeliever. Uh, then after a couple of years, he's returned to the Lord. Amen to that. Wow. But being married to an unbeliever for 23 years has been difficult. As the Bible says, there is no fellowship between light and dark. Also, I stumble a lot as it's easier to be pulled down off the table um, than to pull someone up onto the table. Wow. Things seem different to when I was first saved. And I fear sometimes that I have severely messed up and lost my salvation. Oh, bless him. Listen, I'm not God, so I've... Not, I've I've no idea what your salvation situation is like, but if you walk for 10 years, you, you know, you, you came out of it and you came back and you married an unbeliever, the Lord's saying, you stick with the unbelieving wife, absolutely. You stick with your unbelieving husband. There's no need to divorce whatsoever. Um, but that's why we're counseled in Holy, Holy Scripture to marry someone of the faith. It's because darkness doesn't mix with light. You know, the Lord doesn't mix with Belial. It's, um, it's that simple, but... Well, I doubt you. I, I very much doubt you'd be texting in with a beautiful text like that if you was uh, was on the wide path. So bless you. Is it Nick? That was, yeah. Bless you, Nick. What a lovely, heartfelt text. Yeah, absolutely. OK, Jill here. Wonderful to see you both. I feel I don't hear the Lord's voice as other Christians seem to. How do you know? Oh, beautiful question, Jill. The Lord isn't giving a running commentary on, on our lives all day, every day. But is that still small voice, okay, that we hear in our regenerated spirit? Is there little promptings, okay? And one of the ways that you know if it's him is that he'll never contradict his word, ever, 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 ever. So whatever it is, if whatever it is, if it contradicts this, that's not of the Lord. Um, what the Lord doesn't want you to do, what's her name, Jill? Yes. And what the Lord doesn't want you to do, Jill, and I remember Jeremy, remember uh, Brother Jeremy? Um, Jane's husband had some lovely chats with Jeremy. What he doesn't want you to do is be fearful of um, taking risks, taking chances, okay? If you feel like you're hearing the word of God and you're hearing the Holy Spirit, um, okay, no worries, go for it. The, the Lord is the Lord that created the universe. And when we become born again, okay, we're free. We're free to make mistakes. We're free to have a go, okay? We should be the most bold and fearless people on this earth. So if you feel the Holy Spirit just prompting you in a certain way, Go for it. The Lord can redeem, you, redeem your situation. But, um, you know, quite often we become so worried about, is this the Lord, is this not, that we, we get overtaken, you know, with paralysis by analysis. We sit there analysing, and I'm guilty of this. Oh, am I guilty of this or what? I sit there, you know, ruminating on, on these thoughts, and is this scripture, and is this the Holy Spirit? And in the end, your life's passed you by, and you haven't had a go at anything. So get out there, have a go, and, uh, and you'll know if it's the Lord. He'll never contradict his word. We've got two minutes, Vic, so keep okay. it short and sweet. Well, this is a lovely one from Stephen. Thank you for your message tonight. It has encouraged and quickened my faith in the Lord Jesus. I try not to look back. I'm going to do what you said tonight, fixing my gaze towards the cross. And that is from Stephen. Beautiful. How about that lovely. How about is that? Stephen, keep your eyes fixed on the cross. Keep your eyes fixed on eternity. We are going to rule and reign with Christ. Beautiful text. Oh, and Jeff. Jeff, our resident comedian, many years ago, Jeff, you wrote me a lovely little letter, put your phone number in it, and a few months ago, I went to try and find my beautiful letter from you to give you a phone call. Please text in uh, next week. I think I'm with Derek Walker next week. Uh, Jeff, text him with your phone number. I'd love to love to give you a ring. Be beautiful. What a lovely text that was. Um, Last minute, Vic. So oh, it's got wow. to be short and sweet. So. Um, been battling with the flesh for a long time and have stop. found your word very encouraging, helping me to focus on God. Thank you. And that is from Colin. And that Colin, was it? Yes. Thank you, Colin. Listen, Colin, it's called the good fight of faith. Um, when you're truly saved, you will start to realise how real sin is and how strong your flesh is. And Paul said, it's not me that does these sinful things, it's the sin within me. That's why it's called the good fight of faith. It's, you're called to enter into the good fight of faith and fight it to the end. Why is it a good fight? Because, brother, in the end, we know that we win. So your very awareness of your sinful flesh is a great indicator that, you know, your eyes and your ears have been opened. Vicky, we're down to our last 20 seconds. I've loved it tonight. Uh, no more text. Loved it. Thank you for joining me tonight. I've loved every minute. Thank you so much, Vicky. Yeah, and thank you, everybody, for sending all your texts and emails. Sorry we couldn't read them all. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. been wonderful. Brilliant. Guys, I'll see you next week, hopefully, with Derek Walker. Keep looking up.